Hello class, I'm leaving out um, my face because I don't want to scare you. <laughs> uh, my hair is standing straight up. So um, I'm going to try to get through this lecture for you and so you can study. I apologize for all of this. Um, anyways, let's get going. First and second Samuel, another history books. Uh, what goes on after the time of the judges? Um, actually, we're still in the time of the judges uh, during Samuel. So what's happening here? Uh, we've been calling the time of the judges and Ruth the Dark Ages. And we're, so we're still stuck in the Dark Ages here of the history of Israel. Um, so what happens? Well, I like to make a parallel to the Game of Thrones. And perhaps some of you have watched some of the series on HBO Perhaps many of you haven't. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm just using the imagery here. But the Game of Thrones is an interesting um, series. It comes from um, a five-volume set. And I didn't watch all of it. I watched some of it. But I know enough to perhaps be dangerous about the storyline. Anyways, it's about a medieval civil war. And these dynasties are fighting for the iron throne of the seven kingdoms okay and others are fighting to be free from it so the novels um are not light reads all five of these volumes each of them have like 700 plus pages with a thousand characters so it's complicated so the good news is that like first samuel has 35 pages and 27 characters that's still a lot so this lecture is going to be helpful in highlighting the, what you need to know for the tests on Thursday. So, you know, a brief history is that we're in the Dark Ages. It's about 250 to 300 years of anarchy, looting, plundering, fire, violence, rape, syncretism. We talked about that in the book of Judges. It was complete chaos, and it was dangerous for women and children. They, you know, was a declined leadership. They had a vacuum of leadership, both militarily and just in, in leading the people. Um, they declined spiritually and ethically, morally, all every which way. So God's people desperately needed a revival. And so the story begins with this woman named Hannah. And she's in a bad marriage. She is is um, having trouble getting pregnant and back then just like now if you want to get pregnant it's it's a heartache when you can't and you plan to so she's kind of in a verbally abusive relationship with her husband there's another wife that's having babies like you know rabbits and she's having trouble so what she does is she the book begins with this mother named Hannah and she's praying and, you know, there's different ways to pray. We can pray about stuff. We can pray for things. We can pray into things. And we can pray through things. Well, Hannah prayed through. She didn't stop praying. She prayed until she had a breakthrough. And so she finally gets pregnant, and she gives birth to a little baby boy named Samuel. Okay. So that's how it begins. And the... And the book of First and Second Samuel focuses on three main characters. Of course, Samuel, you can see his driver's license. He's the son of Hannah. And what Hannah does is she dedicates him to the Lord in um, the service of the priesthood. So Samuel is technically the last judge, a military deliverer, um, but he's also a priest um, since he was a little boy. And then you see the other two characters, Saul, um, is the son of Kish, and you don't need to know that, but Saul is from a wealthy family in Jerusalem, or I'm sorry, Gibeah. He's from a wealthy family, he's very handsome, and he becomes Israel's first king, so that's a new development. And the third character is David, and David's well known for writing many psalms. Um, but David is from a different family, the son of Jesse, and we're going to talk about him. But he's also handsome, and he's a musician. He's a shepherd. Um, so those are our three main characters. The other thing you're going to see in this book are two 
main transitions. Um, as far as this point in the storyline, Israel was divided up into a tribal confederation. In other words, when they, when Joshua led the campaign into the promised land, he divided up the land into 12 districts. And so they ruled according to their own tribes. But, you know, if you don't have a central government or a central leader, you're going to be vulnerable to a foreign aggression. And that's what happened uh, during the time of the judges. So the first transition is from a tribal confederation to a monarchy. So that's a new development. We're going to see that they're going to have a king now. And I'll explain this further, but they want to be like all the other nations. And that's not necessarily a good thing because uh, when they demand to have a king, the Lord uh, says, okay, but he warns them what kind of king they're going to have. It's not a good one. And so they, when they say they want to be like all the other nations, they're actually rejecting their distinct calling as a kingdom of priests, a light to the nations. They just want to be like all the other nations, pagan. Okay, so there's a development there. The second transition is that up until this point, you know, since the book of Leviticus, we've been talking about the tabernacle as the meeting place of God. And the Lord set up graciously a mediatorial system because the people did not want to have a personal relationship with God. And so they said, you know, set up a, a system. So he did of priests. And we noted um, in that lecture that the problem with a mediatorial system is that the priests themselves are sinners. They can take bribes. They can become corrupt. And that's what happens in this storyline in First and Second Samuel. And oddly, the Ark of the Covenant is stolen. So we're going to talk about that as well. But you're going to see another transition from the priesthood being the representatives of God to prophets. That's another new development in our storyline, isn't it? We haven't talked about any prophets because there hasn't been any. So there's going to be a change from the priests being the representatives of God's people because they come, if they're corrupt, God's going to turn to somebody else, right? And so he turns to prophets who speak truth into the situation and call the people to return to the Lord and be faithful to the Torah. Okay, two transitions. The, the story begins with this little boy named Samuel and the Lord and his mother has um, dedicated him to the priesthood. So he's just a little boy at the beginning of the story. And there's already a religious scandal. When you look at chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, you'll see that he enters the priesthood and the, there's a head priest named Eli. And Eli has a couple sons. So these are the priests, and they're described as being corrupt. Um, you'll see that Samuel receives a calling, but here, here's the description in 1 Samuel 2. The sons of Eli, these are the priests, okay? They were worthless men. All right, great. Our priests are worthless. That's not good. They do not know the Lord. Are you kidding me? We have priests now that don't know the Lord. And notice that the custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice while the meat was boiling. Now, wait a minute. I don't remember any boiling pots in the tabernacle. Do you? No. So something is really wrong here. They have a boiling pot with a three-pronged fork and the priests would thrust it into the pan. And all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. I think he added a, a bit of, you know, barbecue sauce or something. Okay, I added that. All right, so thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Do you think? Okay, so the dark ages are getting darker. And so here you have this call of the little boy who just seems like a pure heart in the midst of these very corrupt priests. So what's going to happen? 
Well, <clears throat> by chapter 4, you'll see that Israel has a foreign aggressor coming at them uh, to fight them, and they are known as the Philistines. And so um, the Philistines live, we haven't talked about the Philistines, but the Philistines um, live on the coast of the Promised Land on the Mediterranean Sea. We know it as the Gaza Strip. So that's Philistine area back in the day. And so the Philistines come and attack Israel. And so what does uh, Israel do? Well, the priests show up to the battle, the corrupt ones, okay? And they decide that they can win the battle if they take the Ark of the Covenant with them. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, remember, was kept in the Holy of Holies, never to be seen by the people. Only the high priest, once a year, would go into the Holy of Holies. So everything's way off kilter here, isn't it? So they decide to bring the Ark of the Covenant. So these two sons of Eli took this representation of the throne of God out of the Holy of Holies and brought it to the battlefield. And what 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 do we make of that? Well, you know, I'm trying to make some these stories relevant to your life. So here's my application for you. You know, sometimes people will try to use God, use a representation of him. They'll put a statue in their backyard of something or they'll wear a cross, or they'll, they'll think, you know, they try to use God for their own purposes. You know, have you ever been used by somebody? You know, it feels horrible. Um, in Exodus 20, verse 7, you know, one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. And the Hebrew literally there is, you shall not carry the name of Yahweh for emptiness. Carrying the name in maybe a mischievous way or an empty way. Sometimes people think that they can, you know, invoke the name of God and they can control and manipulate their circumstances. Or they act like the name or some relic or representation of God it held some magical power to win the day. Um, well, to carry the name of God for emptiness or mischievously is to misuse God's name or misuse him. To use uh, his name or his representation in an unworthy or mischievous way for vain or selfish purposes. You know, sometimes people use the name of God in prayer. You know, I could pray, Lord, I, I need a, a new Audi, silver with black leather seats. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we, we use God for different things. Uh, even people use God's name to express disgust. You know, when somebody fumbles the ball at a football game, they'll say, Jesus Christ. And I always wonder, you know, why do they say his name? Uh, why don't they just say uh, Buddha or Krishna? I don't know. Um, so they're using the name of God in an unworthy way. And this is what's happening here. Eli. So as you can imagine, God is not happy. And so the Ark of the Covenant is stolen by the Philistines. And the sons of Eli are killed in the battle. And one of the soldiers ran back to Shiloh where the, the tabernacle was, where Eli, his, their dad was. And Eli is about 98 years old. And when one of the soldiers ran back to tell him what happened, Eli's heart was trembling for the Ark of God. And as soon as they mentioned that the Ark of God had been captured, Eli fell over and his neck was broken and he died. So he, he was troubled. His pregnant daughter-in-law, who was married to one of the sons of Eli, suddenly gives birth to a son and she names him Ichabod, which means the glory has departed. That's pretty appropriate. I don't know why anyone would Name their son Ichabod, maybe Icky for short. All right. All right. Okay, so when you get to chapter 5, okay, the Philistines have the Ark of the Covenant, and they take the Ark to one of their cities, Ashdod. 
And you can imagine the celebration the Philistines enjoyed as they carried the Ark of God into the temple of their God. And their God's name was Dagon. And you can see from archaeology that uh, we know what he looked like, what they portrayed him. He was half fish, half man. So here we have the Ark of God, the representative of God's throne on earth, next to a false god. So what a shock to wake up the next morning and the Philistines saw Dagon on the floor. You know, what kind of god has to be set upright by its subjects? And then it happens again the next night. What kind of god has to be carried off to the shop for repairs? You know, sometimes, here we go, sometimes people, they try to place God next to their idols. I like how Tim Keller, in his book about this, counterfeit gods, he says, our contemporary society is not all that different from ancient ones. He says, each culture is dominated by its own set of idols. Each has its own priesthoods, its totems and rituals. Each one has its shrines, whether it be office towers, spas, or gyms, studios, or stadiums, where the sacrifices must be made in order to procure the blessings of the good life. And he says, in ancient times, the deities were bloodthirsty and hard to appease, and they still are. So our idols may be different than half fish, half man, but sometimes people... They try to place God just next to their idols, like it's all okay. So in chapter 5, we see the hands of Dagon broken off, and now the hand of God is on the Philistines. And so what God does is he afflicts them with tumors, the Philistines. Now there's a lot of discussion as to what the tumors were. It's not clear in the Hebrew. Um, back in the day when I was in seminary, most people thought they were a really bad case of hemorrhoids. I don't know. But the Philistines are freaking out because they have a lot of trouble right now. They're inflicted with tumors. And so what they do is like, we got to get rid of this Ark of the Covenant. So they prepare a cart with two cows and they just send them on their way. And it's almost humorous because... Um, they're just allowed to wander wherever they want to go. It's like, okay, cows go where you want to go. And so they head straight to Israelite country. And, you know, I guess you could say sometimes people try to push God away. They're afraid of his holiness. And so the cows and the cart with the Ark of the Covenant head, heads to Israelite country to this guy's... Um, house and when he sees this this cart coming with the cows he rejoices and you know those who have reverence for god's holiness receive him gladly and so the odd part of the story is that the ark of the covenant remains in the backyard of this guy's house for the next 20 years but you can see the the symbolism here that god is not happy with his people and he's not dwelling with them. Okay, so what happens back in Israel is that the people don't want to be like, they don't want to have, be a distinguished nation. They want to be like all the other nations. And so there's a turning point here where the people in chapter 8, they begin to demand to have a king. And <clears throat> the Lord's going to give them a king, but no one's Samuel's not happy Samuel's now an older man now at this point but um they pick out Saul a man named Saul he's tall rich and handsome you know some people vote <laughs> now for people that maybe are the most handsome or the most beautiful ones they don't even look at the the issues involved so they look at Saul and they're like we want this guy to be our king but what kind of king will Saul be? And you can tell that God and Samuel are not happy. But they're going to give him the king. But notice the kind of king um, Saul's going to be. In 1 Samuel 8, 
He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before the chariots. Okay, I don't think this is a good scene. He'll take your sons to run before the chariots. That sounds like a tyrant. Take your daughters. That's going to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. Well, that's nothing wrong with that. Except if your daughters don't want to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. You know, this is tyranny, isn't it? He's going to force people to do stuff. He's going to take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. This is not a good king. And you will be his slaves, it says. And in that day you'll cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. So what, what can we say here is I think that sometimes people, they want God the Savior. They want God to help them when they're in trouble. No doubt about that. But they don't necessarily want the Lord to be king of their lives. Okay, They only want God to come into their lives when, they're, when they need it. So they want to usurp God's rule, and ex but they expect God to step in and deliver them when they're when they need to be rescued all right so it seems like things are getting worse doesn't it yeah it gets worse than i <laughs> than this all right so now we have a political scandal because we have god telling samuel okay they want this king saul and he's going to be a tyrant and he's going to make them their his slaves and so he tells Samuel to go ahead and anoint Saul to be Israel's first king at a high place anoint Saul at a high place why would God tell Samuel to do that we know what a high place is that what terrible uh, rituals occur there child sacrifice cultic prostitution this is bad isn't it? Well, the only way I can possibly interpret this is to say that God's like, okay, you want this king? He's going to be a terrible king. You're visiting the high places. You might as well anoint your king at the high place too. A little bit of sarcasm there. Okay. So we have some very odd developments in the Bible story, don't we? God tells Samuel to anoint him to be the king over Israel at a high place. Well, we see that Samuel is unnerved because he knows that this is wrong. And he denounces it all. I'm in 1 Samuel 12 now. He denounces it all. But I, I want you to see that right at the end of chapter 12, he says um, to Israel, he says, you will know. And see that your your wickedness is great in asking for yourselves king. But, he says, it's never too late to turn things around. He says, fear the Lord, serve him with all your heart. Obey his voice and follow him and pray. And I love to point this out that even though God sometimes gives us the things that we want, like, okay, you want this, go for it. It's going to wreck your lives, but all right. Because God is not the type of God to just, he's just not a tyrant. He lets things happen. But I like how Samuel responds because grace is always available. It's never too late to turn things around. So what, what happens next? Okay, so God tells Samuel to secretly find another guy and anoint him as the king of Israel. So nobody knows about this. So Samuel finds this family, family um, with the father's name is Jesse. And there's a lot of sons in this family of Jesse. And so God tells Samuel, you know, go find another king. And so he looks at all the brothers and God says, it's none of these guys. And so Samuel asks the dad, you know, do you have any other sons? And he's like, yeah, I have. My youngest son, the runt, David, he's out in the fields 
with the with the sheep. He's a shepherd. And so Samuel's like, that's the one. David. Um, and the whole scene kind of makes it very clear that, you know, people obviously judge on outward appearance, like they want us all. But the Lord looks on the heart, doesn't he? He looks on our hearts, and David is described as having a heart after God's own heart. And so I think, you know, what does that mean? You know, David's not a perfect man, young man, but he has a heart for God's heart, which enables him to see people as God sees them. And I think God works with hearts that go after his heart. They don't do everything perfect, but who does that? All right. So all of a sudden we have the secret king. Nobody knows. And you have Saul. All right. So the, the things start to turn in the story when you have a duel of champions. So here comes the Philistines back in the scene. And they want to fight again. You'd think they had would have learned from the little tumor episode but no they're back and they want to fight Israel but this time they want to have a duel of champions and you might know this story with David and Goliath Goliath was a Philistine and he was huge he was huge he was like I don't know nine foot nine nine foot nine he's a big guy and he was ugly anyways he, they wanted to do a battle of champions, and you might not have, maybe you know this, I think it was in the, in the movie 300, which I can't watch those bloody movies, but um, I think it was in this, somebody told me that once. Anyways, when a battle of champions occurs, you have two armies, and instead of them all fighting each other, they throw out their best champion, okay? So they throw out their, their best champion, soldier and the other army throws out their best soldier and these two fight and whoever wins wins the war okay battle of champions so goliath is big and mean and ugly and he's just got a potty mouth he is you know just mocking and taunt, um, taunting Israel because no one wants to fight him. And he says, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So guess what? Nobody wants to fight him except David. And David only has a slingshot. And as you can see the kind of slingshot it is. Um, you put a rock in this like pouch, and they would swing it around and, and toss the rock. Um, so David's used to this. This is what he would use to um, protect his sheep from predators. So he's not used to wearing any armor. And Saul looks at him. He's the only one that stepped forward. He's like, well, here's my armor. You can use this. David tries it on, but of course it's too big. He says, no. Basically, I need to wear my own armor. And so he steps forward. And I would just note that, you know, Goliath, he's, when you look at him, the way he's described in 1 Samuel 17, you know, he's 9 foot 9, he's wearing the scale armor, it says. So this armor weighed over 125 pounds implying this guy's massive okay but notice the scale armor it's like a serpent like isn't it so you have this battle with with uh, another serpent thing and so what david says is he says you know what i come to you in the name of the lord of hosts all that the lord um that all the lord will know that there is a god in israel and he says the battle is the Lord's. So David, he is courageously trusting in God to fight his battles, knowing that the victory, the championship battle, um, will be won by the Lord. So he's got a great faith, doesn't he? David has great faith. So you, ha you have this contrast here between like a Saul and a David. Saul is the tyrant. 
not so good king. And then you have the secret king that seems to have a heart for God. Okay, trusting the Lord. Uh, he's courageous. He's humble. He's all that. Okay. Um, so what David does is he swings his slingshot, hits Goliath in the middle of his forehead with one rock and knocks him out. But he doesn't kill him. And so David runs over to Goliath, takes Goliath's sword, and cuts off his head and, you know, lifts it up for the crowd. And everybody goes wild because, you know, it's like, it's like the underdog winning the March Madness championship, you know. Okay, so here you have this scene and everything turns. Um, because the people in Israel notice, oh, David. David's got, he's cool. Um, and so you have a lot of jealousy going on between um, Saul toward David. And um, David becomes very poppy with the people. So as we wind down here on the lecture, I like to, um, I want you to note the contrast that occurs in this book. You'll see what I'm calling is Saul's anti-kingdom. And what I mean, by, I've made that word up, anti-kingdom, because anti means false or in place of or counterfeit kingdom, okay, a false kingdom. And Saul exemplifies this. And this has been helpful for me to try to note, you know, sometimes we get into a situation in ministry or church life or something, and you can kind of smell that something's not quite right. Um, you can see that there's something wrong and you maybe you can't put your finger on it, but it's, it looks like the kingdom. It acts like the kingdom of God, but there's something wrong, you know? So I call it false spirituality. And Saul does this. He prophesies sometimes. They so think, oh, he's prophesying. He's offer he's offering sacrifices. He's even ordering a fast. Um, it looks spiritual. It looks religious. But then, you know, you have these moments where he's interfacing with a witch and he's got trouble with demons. Um, there's duplicity there, isn't there? And the anti-kingdom is always about image, recognition or power, control. Um, it's not about truth or mercy or justice. So you can see this when David becomes very popular with the people. He's like a national hero. And this causes... Saul to become nuts with jealousy and jealousy you know it makes us fixated on hurting and provoking and playing games and tearing that someone down so Saul is said to eye David from that day on and he you know jealousy just starts on the inside but it doesn't stay there does it it eventually works its way out and this opens the door for darkness to set in and I think, you know, when you look at a anti-kingdom, the marks of the anti-kingdom, there's, there's a facade. It's about image, but underneath the image, there's false spirituality. And there's actually duplicity. What I mean by that is like hypocrisy, as Jesus would call it, where, you know, Saul loves David, but then he picks up a, a spear to try to kill him. You know, that's not love. That's, that's abuse. So the anti-kingdom appears like it's spiritual, but there's something that's wrong. Um, and so, you know, Saul was jealous of David for several reasons, but I think he was afraid of David because the Lord was with David. And then you have David, okay? And David exemplifies God's kingdom, okay, the true kingdom. So it's basically the opposite. I'll put up all my notes here for you. Um, that instead of false spirituality, you see true spirituality. And what is this? And we're going to expound on this uh, after the test when we get into the Psalms. Because what does it mean to have true spirituality? Who is the truly spiritual one? <laughs> it has nothing to do with perfection. You know, it, it's silly to even talk about that. Because no one's perfect. But true spirituality is really all about being honest, being an honest person, being truthful, someone that prays, simple, worships God, 
devoted to God's glory. Yeah, we'll expound on that later. But you'll also see that it's not about image or recognition. It's about being authentic. And there's a couple stories there with David that are just very, you know, you have the, the courageous part of him with David and Goliath. But you also see David, he's very compassionate. He's even compassionate towards Saul. He has a couple moments where he could have killed him and just taken the throne as king, but he doesn't. He even has compassion for his enemies. Um, and then integrity. Um, we'll again elaborate this on this um, after the test, but you can see it especially in his Psalms. He embraces brokenness in his difficulties. You know, David has trouble, a lot of trouble in his family dynamics. And so he he repents, he prays, he cries out to God. You know, he, he he's very much a genuine article when it comes to life and himself and his shortcomings. And I think that's why people love his psalms, is that he's real. So I hope you see the difference between the anti-kingdom and God's kingdom. I think one more slide. Um, what David does, uh, Saul ends up in a battle and he is gravely wounded and he ends up falling on a sword because he knows what the enemies of Israel do to kings, okay? They torture them. So he falls on the sword. He ends up dying in the story. And so David rises up after a long civil war. He unites the kingdom. He unites all the tribes. And what he does is he moves the Ark of the Covenant out of that guy's backyard. <laughs> that was a good move. And he moves the, the Ark to Jerusalem. Now there's another development. What he does is he moves this ark to a city called the City of David. It's his city. He refers to it as his city, which means he's making it the capital of Israel. And this is when God makes a covenant with David. And I can't minimize this at all because it's a very important development in the Bible story. But this covenant that God makes with David is a promise to merge, to merge God's throne with David's throne. And you know, think about it, how can how can you merge God's throne with a human throne? Well, you need a God man to do that. So ultimately, this covenant is talking about, you know, I'm going to merge my throne with yours, David. Your house and your kingdom and your throne will be established forever, eternally. And so you have this idea of Someone coming from David's line, the son of David will come, who will also be the son of God. He's merging both thrones, and he's going to establish God's eternal kingdom on the earth. Of course, we're talking about Jesus, and I think this really is the key to the future merger of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm done. I'll be praying for you um, about the test. Pray for me too. I made it through this. Okay, bye.